in California. You're on with us. Hi, Eric. Hi, guys. I uh, I had a comment about the Hadron Collider. I just I can't believe all of these reports that say it's going to destroy the planet. I mean, every time we make a, a major scientific leap, they say it's going to kill us. You know, the you guys were talking about the atom bomb blowing up the atmosphere. Well, if you go back farther than that, when the steam train first exceeded 40 miles an hour, there were very respected scientists that cited very real calculations that said that if you went faster than a horse could run, the flesh would melt off your bone. <laughs> So I, I have trouble believing that these scientists actually know anything. It's like doctors. They call it practicing medicine for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, pro the point is that George was arguing before, if you have a very tiny probability that something awful is going to happen, do you pull the trigger? Exactly. You know, here's the other fascinating thing about CERN and what's going on. If they want to recreate the conditions that existed a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, what really caused the Big Bang? I mean, did we have some kind of particle accelerator going on then? <laughs> well, that is the $64 trillion question, isn't it? Water, Look, water I am not against basic science. I love basic science. But I also think that you need to do it smartly. We are a multi-trillion dollar a year global civilization. The other day I saw a calculation between the United States and Europe versus Russia in terms of who can swing the weight around. Right. Currently, the annual GNP of Russia is now about $2 trillion. Our annual GNP, U.S., is around $14 trillion. Europe is another 14 or 15 so it's around $30 trillion to $2 trillion in terms of monetary advantage we have over Russia. With that kind of money, given that all of NASA is only $16.7 billion a year, don't you think if somebody wanted to do some really dangerous high-energy experiments – they could go to the moon and build an accelerator on the moon and do it there. I mean, it's, it's like we are now at the point where the really dangerous stuff should not be done in the living room, boys and girls. Do not try this at home. Take it out into outer space where it belongs. Question about the water on Mars. Let's assume it had oceans, maybe even like Earth. We don't have to assume. Well, I mean, we really deep. Ocean. Okay, but well, where did the water go? I mean, some, ah. of, it, some of it probably went down deep. Well, where when, did the rest go? Remember, in, in, in Tom's model, Tom Van Flanderen and my model, Mars, which we have proven to our satisfaction and published, you know, on the web, the, the, the Water on Mars paper, which is available on Enterprise, we have proven now that Mars used to orbit another big planet in the solar system where the current asteroid belt uh, exists. And that at some point, roughly 65 million years ago, for reasons that have not thoroughly been explained, in fact, almost not explained at all, that other big planet blew up, liberating Mars to wander in a much more elliptical orbit around the sun than it otherwise would have had. Now, blowing a planet up in your front yard, George, is not good for beagles or begonias. No, not at all. <laughs> and it left it with incredible scars. It almost destroyed the planet. And it blew away the atmosphere and the oceans and the water. Instantaneously? Well, over a period of hours. Okay. It's, yeah. That's instantaneously as far as Well, I'm in terms of cosmic time, yeah. By the way, that was one of my big gripes with the first Star Wars movie. When George Lucas blew up, uh, 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 was it Alderaan? Y yes. It, it happened much too fast. On a scale like that, a planet blowing up, it would have been majestic as opposed to an instantaneous thing and that was the one thing they got wrong was they didn't appreciate and put on the screen the true scale of planets blowing up as seen from a great distance away it's like watching things in slow motion like edgerton's you know photography of bullets going through uh, uh, light bulbs and stuff like that yeah but the water the water did it go off into space Where yes did... of course it went off into space and did it, some of it hit us Yes, and it formed things like comets, and there's these strange um, objects that are striking the atmosphere that were seen on a certain ultraviolet satellite that, that he called many comets. I think his name was Dr. Lewis Frank at the University of Iowa, and it became a very controversial scientific claim after a while because he claimed that we were being hit by thousands of these objects per day, and if they had the mass of ordinary comets, which is basically the, the mass of water, frozen water, ice, they would be the equivalent of detonating 
you know, several kiloton nuclear weapons all over the Earth in the stratosphere every day. And, of course, nothing like that is seen. Well, the reason is that the water is in the form of ice crystals of very low density, which makes these splotches on the photographs, but doesn't have any real mass. And the water, of course, is part of the oceans of the planet that blew up and Mars. Let's go to Deborah in Wisconsin. You're on with Richard Hoagland. Deborah, hey. Hi. Hi, Mr. Hoagland. I love your sense of humor. (laughs) Thank you. You're welcome. I have two quick questions. They're unrelated, and I'll hang up, so if you could answer them, please. Could you tell me uh, what you know about the 1,000-year-old astronomical observatory on the Yucatan Peninsula? It's it's referred to as a temple, C-A, I'm trying to recall, C-A-R-A, I believe, C-O-L. You mean the caracol? Yes, and that's my first question, okay. so I'll hang up. And my second question is, would you happen to recall um, there, there was a wind turbine that was proposed or was to be an ideal location for it off the East Coast um, near Senator Kennedy's home, and uh, he... That was shot down in Hyannisport. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, he that... strongly opposed it. It was shot down. You know, if you could recall how much... Uh, could have been produced out of that location. I'll hang up. Thank you, sir. Okay, one minute, Richard. Oh, That's great. All. Thanks. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, it's called the Caracol in Yucatan. It was built in the late Mayan period. It was not an observatory with a telescope like we have. It was a building that looked remarkably like an observatory with slits in the walls, and they measured the alignments of celestial objects. And, of course, we now know why alignments angular difference between two objects like Venus and the moon is important because it modulates the background physics, and the Mayans knew about the physics, even if they didn't know it was a physics. They knew that something having to do with time and astronomical observations was dependent on, basically determined the very lives they were leading as they were marking time to observe. On the Martha's Vineyard thing, I know there's been a controversy for years and years about putting a wind farm for generating a lot of megawatts of energy through wind turbines off uh, uh, Martha's Vineyard. And Senator Kennedy has been leading the fight against it because he doesn't want to mess up the environment of the ocean, and people have claimed he doesn't want to mess up his view. It's a little more complicated than that. But uh, as far as I know, the environmental impact statements have gone forward, and the, and the turbine farm is about to get its clearances. Richard C., thanks for uh, letting us wake you up tonight, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, George. All right, my friend. That's Richard C. Hoagland. I'll be back in a moment with Sound Off Open Lines on Coast to Coast AM.